Hello and welcome to Gardening at 58 North. So in this video I'd like to take you along with me again, show you how things are going with the vegetables as I try and feed my family for a year. So this update is going to be just an update of the existing plants that I've been sowing in the last few weeks and I'll also be introducing the more tropical plants which will be growing in here, the polytunnel and hopefully also in the greenhouse once the greenhouse gets fixed. So first of all I'll give you a tour of the plants that you saw in the last few updates, show you how they're doing. So as I say, this is the polytunnel. Now the weather recently has been pretty bad, so in the last update we'd had about two weeks of warm sunny weather and the plants had been growing pretty well because of all the sunshine. Now the last week or so it's been really quite cold, quite cloudy, there's been a lot of snow and, and hail and sleet showers. So the plants haven't grown quite as well, but they've, they've still done pretty pretty good, all things considered. So although the temperatures were close to freezing for a lot of the days outside, in here if there's a bit of sunshine it's still got up to about 20. So look on the right hand side here, the strawberries are looking pretty good, we've got quite a few flowers starting to come on them, you can see there. So we'll probably get a crop of strawberries in about a month's time. Coming round, this is the lettuce, so we've been using this as cut and come again, just taking individual leaves as we need them. We've already harvested most of the radishes from this patch, there's a couple of radishes like this one here, which still need to be harvested. But generally this has been really good, this is now producing enough lettuce for two people constantly, probably more like four people every day. You could probably give four people a bowl of lettuce from this. It just grows so quickly. There's lots of nitrogen in the soil, so it's growing rapidly. And even though we're harvesting it regularly, it's just growing faster than we can really harvest it. So even a small section like this, which is probably about two meters by about 50 centimeters, so just over six foot by just under two foot, and it's producing lots of nice lettuce. And we've been pretty lucky this year. There's not been too much slug damage. We do have some slug traps in the form of, of beer that we, we have over there, which traps and kills the slugs. But we've been pretty lucky, you can see there is some slug damage on a couple of the leaves, but generally it's done well. In previous years we've had it where the whole thing has been killed off at the seedling stage by slugs, but this year it is looking particularly good. And coming down here, this is the section with rocket and radishes. The radishes are done great, they're ready for harvesting now, you can see here there's lots of radishes, so they're going nicely with the salad, uh, salad crop from the, the lettuce, so they're adding to a nice salads at the moment. These will be harvested soon. And then you can see underneath them, there's lots of little rocket plants which are starting to grow quite well. So what will happen is we'll harvest all these radishes and then there'll be lots of uh, rocket will take over the space. And this area will be full of rocket, so we'll have something spicy in our salads. And over this side is where we're supposed to have the perpetual spinach, but for some reason it just never grew. I, I don't know why it never really germinated. The first batch of seeds are put out, they all got eaten off, the actual seeds, not the seedlings, I'm not sure what ate them. Um, so the second lot I buried under the ground and they didn't even germinate, so I don't know what's going on. We've just got this one plant here and that's about it for this patch, but the rest of it is uh, radish. So we have actually got a crop still growing, you can see some of them are getting to quite a nice size and definitely ready for harvesting, so this section is doing pretty well. The frogs as well, they've become a lot more active, there's probably about 10 of them at the moment. You can see there's a couple of young ones, probably from a year or two uh, of age, you can see there. And we've got some other ones there, and then you can see there's a third one. And there's some pretty big ones in there as well. Um, they're all at various ages and sizes at the moment. So they seem to be doing the job. Um, there's not too many slugs this year, so that's hopefully the, uh, the frogs that have been doing that. There hasn't been as much frog spawn this year, or uh, tadpoles, so... Hopefully we'll still get a new batch of frogs, we'll see. But certainly we need to try and get this a bit cleaner, this water, it's very green and a bit stagnant. But it's good to see all the frogs are doing quite well. You can see five right now out of the water and they're just the young ones, there's some pretty big ones there as well. So coming along here, we've got the Japanese cabbage here or Japanese mustard. This is looking pretty good. I'm probably gonna plant this outside, possibly today if the ground's ready. This is quite a cold hardy plant. This can handle the cold and the wind quite well. So that can go outside soon and give us a crop of salad later in the year. The problem is, although we've got this lovely growing environment now for salad and we've got a really good crop down there, salad when it gets too hot, it just goes to seed and, and then it gets bitter and it starts producing leaves. So this is a perfect place for growing salad at the moment, but once it gets too warm, the lettuce will go to seed and then outside will actually be a much better environment for growing lettuce. So it'll grow here for another month or so. And then once it gets too hot in May or June, then we'll have to start sowing some more outside. And until we get that sown, at least this, this um, Japanese cabbage can take the place of it. The problem is if I sow lettuce outside now, it's too cold and windy, it'll probably die off, it won't really do very well. Whereas this can survive the colder weather and grow throughout the hot weather as well. So this is just bridge that gap between sowing out the next batch of lettuce outside and having 
lettuce ready for when the lettuce inside is finished. So over here we've also got some more lettuce. This is a mixture of radish, lettuce and turnip. So you can see here, this lettuce isn't so much cut and come again lettuce, this is the one that you kind of harvest as a whole head of lettuce, but we might also use this as cut and come again. So you can see the lettuce is doing well, there's quite a bit growing up here. We've also got um, turnip, the turnip is the kind of slightly hairier ones, and they're slightly purple stemmed, you can see that one down there. It's purple top Milan uh, turnip, so they're quite small ones, used a bit like radish and salad and stuff like that. And there's also some different types of radish in here. And I can also see a couple of coriander plants. I didn't plant them, but we had coriander in this bed last year. It's self-seeded and we always get a few seedlings popping up every year, so they're always welcome. And then further along here, this is quite a big section of this mix here, but then starting in this area is the beetroot, again mixed in with uh, radish and turnips. So radish and turnips are doing well. You can see the reason we planted them together. The beetroot is a very slow growing plant compared with the radish and, and the other ones and it needs slightly high temperatures to do well. So you can see there, there's still tiny little seedlings. They're only really just come up and germinated. Whereas the radish will be ready for harvesting in about a week or two. The turnips will probably be ready in about a month, but the beetroot will probably be another six weeks to two months until they're ready. So it just lets us crop the land, it keeps down the weeds, and it just gives us a double crop in that small space. So the, the beetroot are doing okay. They're just a bit slow compared with the other plants. And then at the end here, We've got spring onions, loads of them starting to come up now. You can see they just kind of look like grass, so they're, they're not much to see at the moment. And again, they're quite slow growing compared with some of the other plants. So we tend to crop these again with radishes, give us a quick crop. And then once the radishes are harvested, we'll have loads of spring onions in this patch ready for harvesting later in the year. And then at the back, you've got some more strawberries and one of my Insetti Ventricosums, which is just starting to come into growth. And I'll probably do an update when I do my banana update later in the year. So there are all the plants that are in the bed. This one was actually in the third part of the first video. So this is, uh, as you can see, is only probably about two weeks ago I sowed that. It's growing well. This was sowed about a month ago and uh, you can see the size difference but they are catching up now because the light levels have really improved over the last few weeks as it's now April. I'll also give you an update of the seeds that I sowed in the first week. So these are um, some leeks that were sown in January. These are leeks that were sown, I think it was the beginning of March. You can see they're a lot smaller. We've also got various sunflowers. We've got the honesty there. It's looking a bit yellow. The problem is when I used to compost from our garden mixed with, uh, with soil, it's, it's rich in potassium and phosphorus, but there's very little nitrogen. The problem with, with compost is the organic matter in the compost pulls a lot of the nitrogen out of the, the, the mixture. As it's rotting down, the microbes use nitrogen to break down the carbon. So when you have a compost, although compost can add a lot of nutrients to the soil, it, it almost never adds nitrogen unless you've got a very high nitrogen mix in your compost. compost. So that's why these plants are looking a little bit stunted. Same with some of the sunflowers, especially the ones which I'll show you in a minute. They're looking a little bit yellow. The growth hasn't been particularly good. So what I'll be doing is I'll be giving all of these a liquid feed. I might also give some of the kohlrabi here a liquid feed. They are growing okay, but I would have liked a little bit faster growth. So I'll give these a feed and I'll give it a feed that's quite high in nitrogen because it is the nitrogen that's lacking the most. I'll give them all a nitrogen feed. That should boost them nicely. or will get some much faster growth. You can see here again, the sunflowers are a little stunted. I would be hoping for a slightly faster growth and a darker green colour. I might also give them a bit of Epsom salt to increase the magnesium levels and that will just give them a nicer darker green colour. So it's the same with these plants in here. You can see these aren't as bad because these are actually in multi-purpose compost. So these are looking a little bit better. These might not actually need a feed. Most of the brassicas I did put in multi-purpose compost to avoid club root. And then we've also got those seedlings that didn't germinate last month. Um, it looks like they're not going to germinate. You can see the red cab is there. I can just check the date. It's actually exactly a month to the day because today is actually the 11th of April. So these are definitely probably not going to germinate. So what I'll do is I'll check which ones haven't germinated and I'll re sow them. I'll also see what we're lacking. So for example, the cabbage here, I think there's only this is the only one of the golden cabbage or, or green cabbage basically. Um, so I need to re sow them today or maybe next week once I've got the seeds in and hopefully we won't lose too much of the season. It will be a month behind, but at this time of year with the warmer weather, hopefully things will catch up a bit. We've got plenty of other ones we can use as substitutes, but unfortunately we've already got plenty of broccoli, so we don't really want to have loads of broccoli, we want to get some more cabbage. So I'll try and get some more things uh, sown soon to try and make up for the ones that didn't germinate. And then over here, it's just more sunflowers again. 
they're looking a bit smaller than I would hope for so I'm probably going to give these a liquid feed just to give them a little bit of a boost. So in today's video I'd also like to introduce you to the tropical plant which will be going out here in the polytunnel once the weather warms up a bit. So what we basically do is to make the most of the season we grow cool temperate plants in here in springtime because it's too cold outside it's, it's probably around five degrees a lot of the time close to zero at night about eight degrees during the day uh, for, for most of February March and April so it's a bit cold for anything to really grow outside and the ground is quite cold so even if you have a warm day the plants just sit there they don't really grow so what we do is we grow a lot of the cool season crops in here just to get them going so we get a good crop and, and the beds are actually utilised. If we were to put the tropical plants in here now the problem is they would just get stunted, the ground is too cold, the night temperatures are too cold and they wouldn't do well. So we get this good crop of cold temperate plants now. Once the temperatures get quite warm in May then these will be coming out and they'll be replaced with the tropical plants and they'll grow in here the whole summer right into autumn. So these are them here. What I've done is I've started them at my house because I've got better propagators at mine and I've got grow lights so I can get these started earlier. The problem is here in Scotland the light levels are quite low in winter so even if you germinating them and growing them in the house on a sunny windowsill there's just not enough sun in that windowsill so I need to have grow lights to, to really boost them so I'll show you what I've got here I've also got three more chilies inside the house which are actually quite a bit bigger than these plants I'll need to repot them as well today so these are the sweet peppers we did really bad this year with germination I don't know what happened I've sown three sets of uh, seeds and each batch has been pretty bad the first batch only this many germinated. I was hoping to get about 20 or 30 plants. The second batch, none germinated. The third batch, I've just got all this, all the basically all the seeds I've got for sweet peppers. Put them in a, in a, in a seed starting pot, and I'll just see what comes up. I'm not too hopeful, uh, but hopefully we'll get something. It is a little bit late now. Normally I sow these in January, and so we get decent sized plants by this time of year. We are quite a bit behind. I'll show you some photos from last year, and there were almost one or two foot tall plants. The problem is with sweet peppers, they are quite slow growing in our climate and I need to get them started really early so we can make the most of them for the growing season. So this year I won't be having as many peppers as I'd hoped for. The plan was because the tomatoes for the last few years have been suffering with tomato blight, the plan was to have no tomatoes in here this year so that we can cut the cycle of blight and just have the tomatoes in the greenhouse. So I was going to make up for the loss of tomatoes with sweet peppers, but unfortunately we're still going to have quite a lot of empty beds because there's not enough sweet peppers have grown. So I'll probably have to make that up with courgettes, although not too many because even one courgette plant can crop a huge number of courgettes. So I'm also going to put some more sweet corn in than I would have normally, and I'm also going to put in cucumber and probably some, try some melon for the first time this year. I'm not sure if melon would grow well in this climate, it's a bit far north really, even in a polytunnel, but we'll give it a go and we'll see what comes. So looking back here we've got the sweet peppers we've got some chilies coming on in the house we never grow a huge number of chilies because we go for quite hot varieties so you only need one or two chilies per dish so three or four plants is enough for three or four people to be honest you can start harvesting loads of chilies throughout the summer and even if you use four or five chilies a day just four or five plants is probably enough so the other plants we've got i've got some tomatoes here some of these are about half of them we've grown here the other half probably going to my aunt's these are Elsa Craig tomatoes. So we have got some other cherry tomatoes coming on at my house. They're a little bit further behind. Um, it took me a while to find the seeds. And with cherry tomatoes, you can actually grow them a bit later. Because they're such small tomatoes, they ripen a lot quicker. So you don't have to be critical with timing with them. But these are quite nice looking plants now. You see they definitely need repotting. So I'll be separating these and putting them into new pots. And then we've got the sweet corn as well. This needs to be separated and put into, into individual pots. We've got relatively good germination here. This was some new seeds. So you can see with a batch of new seeds, pretty much every single one is germinated. I'm not sure why there's four in a row here which haven't. Um, maybe the temperature wasn't cr quite correct on the propagator on that side but all the other ones are pretty much germinated nice healthy seedlings and then here is an old pack of seeds the same variety but the seeds are about three or four years old you can see I've only got about five seeds that came up here so fresh seeds can be quite important depending on the variety of the plant and then I think in the last update I also showed a lot of uh, ornamentals so I've got a load of cosmos here which is ready for potting on into individual pots. What I might do because they're really small I'll probably put them in a tray system like this just to give them a little bit more space but without using up all our uh, nine centimeter pots because we don't have an, unlim an unlimited number of them 
also it saves on compost and then we've also got quite a lot of calendula as well which I'll be planting up today. In the background you can see there's some uh, polyanthus they're a little bit unhealthy they've been in my polytunnel but they've been hit by slugs caterpillars and aphids so they need to be planted out in the ground I'm putting them in the woodland garden although I'm, I don't think they'll be included in this update. So what I'll do now is I'll get started and I'll start putting out the tomatoes into their new pots. So I'll show you how I pot on the tomatoes because I pot them on slightly differently than I do with most other plants. Most plants when I repot them I keep them at a similar level that they were previously in the pot or if they have some um, seed leaves that I can see I'll bury them just a little bit deeper up to where the seed leaves are. On a lot of plants they can actually grow new roots out of that stem. The stem above the, the first set of leaves that, that normally can't grow any roots but the, um, the stem underneath the first set of leaves can. You can actually see it quite clearly on this, um, this pepper here. There's some new roots still starting to come out there so with this for example I will just probably bury it about half a centimeter deeper and just allow, allow those new roots to come out. But with um, tomatoes it's quite different. Tomatoes readily root along the whole stem even above the first set of leaves. So as an example I would choose one of my leggier plants and this one is there's two in there so I need to separate them. So this is one of the leggier ones and what I tend to do if they are quite leggy plants is I actually cut off the lowest leaves like this because I'll actually be burying the stem quite deep and every time I repot the tomatoes I pot them deeper and deeper and when I put them in the soil eventually they go even deeper again. So sometimes I actually put these a foot deeper than what they were originally and this is a great a great way to get rid of leggy plants. So you can see here it's a little bit leggy, it's not too bad but if I bury this up to here in the pot and if I have a very leggy plant I might even use a longer pot than a nine centimeter pot then it becomes a lot more stockier. Loads of roots will come out of all this stem down underground and so instead of just having roots at the base there the whole lot will be rooting so get really good roots established straight away and then you'll get some really good thickening of the stem. So if you have very thin spindly looking stems you bury them all the new roots grow out and then you get a really thick stocky plant and it looks much better. So what I often do is I put this right to the bottom of the pot without putting any soil in the bottom and then I just bury the entire stem. If they're incredibly leggy I don't have any today because these have been under grow lights but they can get really thin flexible stems I will actually bury them like this so I'll bury I'll actually bend the root round so it's actually kind of like a U shape like that and then I can just bury the whole thing underground. And that's something I do if it's particularly leggy these ones aren't too bad so I'll be putting them in straight but uh, I'll just use this one as, as an example as what I would do if it was a particularly leggy tomato plant. I just curve the stem right round I then just bury the whole thing with compost and then that will grow quite well because of that. And when it comes to soil with these tomatoes what I've done to keep the costs down and um, also to get them acclimatized to our soil is I've got a mixture of our topsoil and our compost um, with a little bit of feed added, not a lot. I need to probably liquid feed these and that will just keep the cost down having our own, our own soil instead of buying in loads of compost. And the other thing is I want to start getting them acclimatized to our soil. So these have just been growing in a rich multi-purpose compost which is 100% organic based. They're going to be going now into a compost which is half compost, half soil, probably a bit more on the soil side. And that will just start getting the roots to acclimatize to a soil type, type compost. And then when they go in the soil itself, it will just be 100% soil with a bit of compost that we've added in, in in early spring. So it's just to get them acclimatized step by step it just seems that they help them a little bit if you can do step by step when you repot them slowly add a bit more soil and then when they do grow in the soil eventually the roots are more acclimatized to it and they'll grow much better. So what I'll do is I'll give this a good water now and then I'll be probably giving them a, a liquid feed. The uh, soil mix I'm using isn't particularly high in feed and tomatoes really love a lot of feed. Now most of the season probably for at least 80% of the season I'll be feeding these regularly with tomato feed but at this stage, right up until they get the first set of flowers, I normally give them a, a balanced feed, so it's equal for all parts of nutrition. Sometimes if they're looking a bit poorly, I might even give them a, a feed that's a little bit higher in nitrogen just to give them a quick start. I find they just grow really fast. They get really big lush leaves, big thick stems, get a really nice stocky strong plant very quickly if you give them a high nitrogen feed. And then once I put them in the soil or once they start to flower then I'll switch to a, a, a tomato feed which is high in potassium because most of the season you want to be giving them a tomato feed. You want high potassium to encourage lots of flowers, lots of good fruit set. If you kept giving them a high nitrogen feed the whole life they would just grow loads of big leaves and lots of stems and you wouldn't get such a heavy harvest of tomatoes. But when I'm trying to get them to grow fast at the beginning of the year and become nice large plants then I will give them a high nitrogen feed. So I'll go ahead now, I'll pot up all these tomatoes 
and then my other tropicals as well which will be a similar kind of soil mix to this and then I'll be placing them into the mini greenhouse with a heater just to make sure that they're warm enough at night. So that's all the tropical plants now potted on to slightly larger pot sizes. So these will be staying here in the mini polytunnel, you know, the mini greenhouse inside the polytunnel. And the idea with this is during the day it'll be open, it'll be around about 20 degrees in the polytunnel, maybe up to 30 on a nice warm sunny day. And then at night time we'll put a timer on with a heater at the base there. And that will just keep the thing a little bit warmer. Because at night time it's only 2 or 3 degrees warmer inside the polytunnel than it is outside. So we'll just need a little bit of extra heat just to stop them getting a cold shock. Now we'll probably not have any chance of frost even without the heating, but with tomatoes and most tropicals if it goes below about 12 degrees Celsius they get cold shock and they just grow a lot slower and they become stunted. So it just needs a little bit of heat just to stop it from getting too cold. So I think that's it for this part of the polytunnel tour. As I say everything seems to be growing quite well apart from a couple of the seedlings down there but I'll be giving them a feed this week and hopefully that'll boost them on a bit. So that's all for this video. Now I'll see you again soon in my next video update. Now in that one what I'll be doing is I'll be planting out the peas and beans and creating the supports that they need to grow upon.